think she's a pro. She's a pro. Yes. Someone call me an old pro. Which I love. <laughs> How clever of you. <laughs> Well, I think like no other introduction needed because of all that recording stuff that we do in the beginning. Like, this is, yes, a stripper podcast. Um, we're here today with Caitlin Bailey, so we're just going to jump right into it. Hello, please say hello. Hello, <laughs> thank you for having me. Oh my god, beyond excited to have you. I've been like getting all of your emails because I'm on your newsletter list, and Yay. Um, yes, and I've just heard about you for ages, eons, because you're super active. Um, activists in the sex worker community. And like, we're just going to talk about all of that and who you are, if that's okay with you. Okay, great. I would be lying if I pretended it wasn't my favorite topic. I can tell you. like, I watched your stand-up comedy today also. (laughs) It's so funny because I started with like your professional stuff where you're like... It's a hard jump. Yeah. In front of like really professional people. And then (laughs) then I was like, oh my God, like... Oh, she's like so cool and so smart. And then I watched her comedy and I was like, oh, no, she's like rad. Like nothing to be worried about at all. <laughs> You're so silly. Are you calling me a dirty hoe? Is that what just happened? Yeah, was you that- are. Yes. Okay, it's fair. Amazing. Reasonable. <laughs> yes. No, I was like, oh, my God, I can actually relate. Um, yes. Because like your other stuff, your work is so incredible and you're Thank doing you. really incredible stuff and you're like in front of politicians in like really important governmental type rooms. I do feel like getting heard by the stuffies, if I can call them that, um, is part of my job. Uh, And so, yeah, thank you. I appreciate the like code switching that you see between uh, comedy and legislators and politicians and people in academia that don't get it yet. Yeah, totally. And and um, speaking of not getting it, I was watching the NBC special that you shared in your newsletter. Yes. And um, the women on there that yeah. they're doing the work in – that they're they're anti-sex work and they think that all sex workers are victims, that we're all yeah. traumatized and we only do it because we're traumatized yeah. and we're, uh, we're unaware. We're yeah. unaware. And, um, and that they seem like very intelligent and thoughtful – and well-intentioned people yeah. that I could have dinner with. Absolutely. But. Right. <laughs> I mean, the problem, of course, is that prostitution has become a symbol of violence against women, right? And this, yeah. you know, started, goes way back to the white slave law, which was, you know, one of our first moral panics on this issue. And like so many of these, like, anti-sex politics, um, it comes down to a moral panic often about, you know, women's socio- socioeconomic uh, or, like, literal mobility, um, race relations, fears around immigration, all of that gets wrapped yeah. up. And so because we're, you know, suffering after a hu- over 100 years of propaganda, convincing smart, well-meaning people that prostitution is violence against women, you right. get a lot of smart, well-meaning people that take the position that all prostitution is wrong. And there are also tons of people out there that have had horrific lived experience, right, in the sex yeah. industry. They faced exploitation. They faced violence. They faced the same horphobia that we all face and decided that the work itself was the problem, not right. the exploitation, not the violence, and not uh, the horphobia. And, you know, I understand that path. Uh, right. But the reality is that the more we criminalize this work, the more dangerous we make it for everyone. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And does it give our audience context for those who may have not seen the NBC special? It was very specifically about the um, half like decrim laws in the state of Maine. Do you want to because you're you know, you've you've been working on this. Yes. Do you want to kind of fill our audience in? Yeah, absolutely. So Maine, unfortunately, uh, late last year became the first U.S. state to officially adopt uh, the policy that goes by many names, right? Some people call this the Swedish model or the Nordic model. I've heard people call it the feminist or the equality model. People call it the entrapment uh, or the end demand model. But no matter what it's called, the philosophy behind this policy is that we 
can and should eradicate prostitution by criminalizing demand, meaning clients and also uh, third party facilitators. So, right. you know, what happens is, uh, you know, they say, um, you know, it's all wrapped up in these like very uh, stereotypical, um, obviously heteronormative ideas around sex work, right? Like all of the girls that are selling sex to filthy men uh, are victims of, um, you know, misogyny, um, you know, their, their, their minds can't be trusted. They need to be treated like childlike right. victims. And the evil men who are, you know, negotiating consent or paying for sexual services services are the real villains here, as are the procurers. And so the narrative is that this is a bill that will go after pimps and johns, and they make no distinction whatsoever between men who pay for sex or people who help, you know, sex workers do their job, like God bless right. the person who helped me set up my website and who helped me schedule things or who or helps me do security you, your or, yeah, or my landlord or my right. roommate or my loved one. Right. And they cast these folks as uh, as predators. And the problem with this policy is that, of course, it makes it impossible to distinguish between predators and clients. Um, it reduces the negotiating power of sex workers and everywhere this policy has been implemented, violence against sex workers goes up. Definitely. And we see that because the the clients, I don't want to use the J word, the clients are it's like- It's not accurate. Right. There are Johns and Janes and Jingleheimer Schmitz that are, you know, like all all kinds of people all kinds buy of people, and exactly. sell sexual services and right. have for all of human history. Sex right. work is older than capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. It's the oldest- According would to say. you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, archaeologists will quibble with you about this, but like, yes, <laughs> it's older than money. Yeah. No, totally. Because, I mean, we were exchanging things before money for services, sure. et cetera. Yeah. Um, yeah. But obviously with the clients now needing to like be more cautious Correct. than when the sex worker is screening the client. It um, makes it impossible. Exactly. And then the client's like, no, I don't want to give you my personal information because what if what I don't if you're know you cop. and you're a cop? Yeah, right. exactly. And so I just wanted to say that so people who are really trying to learn the Nordic sure. model understand exactly why it's so dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for uh, allowing me Yeah, I mean, to I think, you know, from an inch away, uh, it is absolutely impossible to help people that you're trying to eradicate. And so the philosophy behind the Nordic model is that we can eradicate prostitution. And so the policy is not helpful to people that depend on this work for their livelihood. And it doesn't matter where they're at on the spectrum of like choice, circumstance or coercion, you know, disrupting that, criminalizing that it pushes it further into like a gray or black market. Um, yeah. And, you know, we, we know what prohibition does to markets, right? It doesn't make them safer. But you're work. absolutely right, you know, specifically with criminalization, with asymmetrical criminalization, right? When you criminalize clients instead of sex workers, you create all of these perverse incentives that really undermine all of the different ways that we have tried to keep ourselves safe over, right. over centuries. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so this, it's, it's might be happening in more other states, right? It's, unfortunately, it's a very popular policy. So, and it's specifically popular amongst legislators because because of the great work that sex worker rights advocates have done for decades. They've heard good things about decriminalization, but it feels too radical. So the way that they got this bill passed in Maine is they called it partial decriminalization. Right. So they stole, right, all of the hard work that we've done convincing legislators that arresting sex workers is bad and wrong and leads to bad outcomes, right? Right. And then they made it less radical by continuing to criminalize pimps and johns, the real predator in this situation. Uh, and they did that, of course, speaking over and for uh, sex workers who, who do this work. Well, that's the thing, though. The one, the politician woman, the one that passed. Mm -hmm. Do you recall her name? 
I don't, unfortunately. You know who I'm talking about, right? Yes, this is the woman who really advocated for it. It was sort of like a retirement present for her. Yes, by, and she yes. died five days after yes, the yes. law passed. Yeah. Well, she claims to talk to sex workers, and and that's what baffles me when I hear right. people in these outside of our community mm-hmm. positions saying things like, well, the people I've talked to. So I'm like, well, who are you talking to? Because your number one ally is a sex trafficking activist who also wants to eradicate um you know, abortion. Uh, consensual sex work. Yes. Oh, and abortion. I didn't yes. know that she was there's also a, trying to do that. Yeah, there's a Jesus. ton of overlap so, between so Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> conflation, right? Between like yeah. trafficking has the you know, this word it sort of depends on whether you, you have like a liberal or a conservative lens on it, but it can mean anything from LGBTQ content. Uh, Mm. information about contraception, right? The conflation with information um, about women's bodies and obscenity goes back to the Comstock laws of the 1870s. So, you know, there are a ton of folks in the anti-choice movement that, you know, are their end goal is to criminalize all pornography, but they jump on things like the Nordic model or the end demand model as a way of suppressing, suppressing prostitution. Right. And maybe also like some of us see it and we're like, oh, partial decrim, that sounds great. And then we're just right. kind of like let our guard drop a little Correct. is kind of what I'm seeing. I feel yes. like it's a mind game. Like they're mind gaming Absolutely. us. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and it, what – oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, please go ahead. I was just going to ask, do, have, do we know what other states that are thinking of doing this? Massachusetts is considering Uh it, but they're also Uh considering full decriminalization. New York is considering it. They're also considering full decriminalization. So you will often have, Mm. and I think this is a great learning opportunity for many of our legislators, right? When you have these bills that go up, you know, sort of back to back, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful opportunity for our activists to explain the important differences between, you know, I hate to adopt their language, but what's being sold to them as a partial decriminalization bill versus a full decriminalization bill. And, uh, you know, they'll often play with language, right? We like to use safety and health. They like to use safety and health. So it can be genuinely Mm. confusing for Mm. legislators that don't have deep knowledge on this subject. And it's up to sex worker rights advocates to educate our elected officials, to educate ourselves about how to talk about this in a persuasive way. Right. Um, and we have to play the long game. I My prediction is that similar to the age verification laws that we see popping up all over the country around pornography, we're going to see a similar trend with end demand laws. And so, you know, sex worker advocates on the ground need to be documenting the way that these policies um, are hurting us physically, mm. socially, psychologically, so that we can educate our communities and lawmakers. I don't think any of this is getting fixed tomorrow. Oh, God, no. Yeah. No, this is like a lifetime of work. Like it has been from all the people is, that came before us. Yeah, this is a multi <laughs> This is multi-generational labor, guys. Yeah. We are, yeah. Reclaim your legacy. We are in it. Yeah, and will be for like yes. another couple hundred years, maybe. For sure. Hopefully. God, not that long, but yeah. Yeah. Um, Age verification. You've been talking about that lately. Yes. Um, do you want to? Sure. I mean, it's it's another example of a law that sounds like a good idea, right? Who could be who supports children watching pornography, right? Zero people, right? And yet, from you know, an inch away, if you look behind the curtain, the stated intent of many of the like of the advocates that are pushing for these laws, their goal um, isn't just to prevent children from seeing pornography. It's to erase pornography from the accessible internet, right? We are losing the free internet. Um, Mm. And, uh, you know, I think it's also important to understand that this is the same coalition that's fighting for end demand laws, criminalization. It's a combination of feminists who believe that all sex work is violence against women, right? This comes from the porn wars of the 1970s and also the 1870s and probably the 1770s. (laughs) Um, And also, you know, more explicitly anti-sex conservatives that are a little bit more transparent about what their actual goals are. 
And this coalition, um, you know, criminalized not just, uh, you know, prostitution and pornography in the 1860s, but also alcohol and abortion. And we did it all in the name of protecting women. And so right. that same coalition is really threatening um, our ability to share information about our bodies, uh, you know, sexual health, um, because all of it can be banned in the name of obscenity of these obscenity laws or protecting yeah. children from information. Yeah, that's a really good point because like when we were growing up, for instance, we were mm -hmm. we grew up without the internet, right? And Yeah, we grew up without the internet when being gay was still illegal, uh most right. places. Yeah. Yeah. And we were learning about sex from like our parents who weren't very good at talking about it. At least mine weren't. I or don't statistically know doing it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And or school, which was mm -hmm. horrible, horrid, right? And so I, I can wasn't taught proper, were you? Uh, no, I came of age during George W. Bush's abstinence-only education program. So we actually had like a Southern Baptist minister's wife come to our school and give a presentation. Um, and I remember specifically uh, two things. One, um, she put glue on a piece of paper and then stuck another piece of paper to it and then tore it apart um, and was like, this is what happens to your body when you have sex with people. You leave pieces of yourself all over them. Oh, my God. How dramatic. And yeah. And then um, I remember also uh, we were in middle school, right, which is like, I think, scientifically the most awkward age. And she brought the she asked for volunteers. Right. She gave us no information about what we were volunteering for because consent was not a part of this education. Um, she brings right. this young like seventh grader up on stage, asked her to squeeze toothpaste out of a uh, out of uh, a toothpaste container to yeah, thank yeah. you i'm like what yeah. a box i don't know it's not uh, anyway um and then in front of everyone was like now put the toothpaste back in the tube that's that's how your virtue works it's easy to lose and it's impossible to get back and that was the sex education that was offered at my public high school in raleigh uh north carolina circa like 2003 that's so abstract yeah yeah now, I was lucky. Um, my parents sent me to the Our Whole Lives, which is the sex education that's offered through the Unitarian Universalist Church Program. And they were very queer friendly, very pro-choice, very consent forward, very anti-shame. And I remember learning about disability and sex, uh, people of all sizes having sex, uh, how That's to amazing. communicate. That was incredible. Yeah, but it was a private program that my parents had to pay for, and it was offered through my church and that's not the kind of sex ed that all of the churches are offering i don't know any church that would all of the church i don't know any church that would offer shout that. out to the unitarians I, you know they are. i know my family i have family members that have been unitarians and i've just i've always thought positive things about i no shade to unitarians anyway they're they're pretty cool and that is very cool but i feel like this age verification thing like like, are they putting that on websites where not just like hardcore pornography websites, but also like on sex um, education? Yeah. Is that also happening? And the answer is yes, because okay. when you talk to legislators about mm -hmm. what what it is it that they consider to be obscene, what is it that they consider to be content that's harmful to minors, right. they include information about gender affirming care. They include information about contraception. They include information about pleasure and masturbation and sexual health, right? These are folks that genuinely believe that we corrupt children children by giving them access to information. And yeah. And the other thing that I think is important for folks to understand is, <laughs> and this, this is important to me because these are the kinds of conversations, like I hang out with smart, well-meaning people, right? Like me and my husband, like that's our own, cool hangs only. And a lot of my peers have genuine and earnest and well-meaning questions around like, well, I don't want 13 year olds to be able to just access hardcore pornography. And I hear that. I genuinely do. Yeah. However, creating age verification rules that apply to pornography specifically, I don't think people understand the like logistical or data, the ask of that right? And how vulnerable all of our personal information is. Uploading mm -hmm. your ID 
to a third party in no. order to access a website is more dangerous than people watching other people have sex. It just is. Yeah. Yeah. Or like a lack of education is more dangerous. I right. mean, you know, we see Billie Eilish is very vocal about anti-porn. Yes. She was also watching it as a young child trying mm -hmm. to understand sex. Um, and it's like, where were your parents? Where right. was the conversation? Well, they're filling a hole. As, yeah. Especially as a budding famous person who will be sitting in front of interviewers who are who harass sexually harass children regularly, yes. particularly our young females artists. Yeah. So, like, I'm just I don't I mean, understand. It's, it's it's educational. I know porn isn't ideal for children to watch, but it is what people are doing. And like, it's better than a complete lack of information, right? We know exactly. this, right? Like, right. sex educators, people that study this issue, you people have an idea in their mind that we're somehow protecting children by withholding or denying access to information. When in reality, not being able to access that information, not having language about it, creates the conditions for vulnerability right. to all kinds of exploitation and abuse right? right we see this in the catholic church we see this in the protestant church we see this in all of the most repressive communities are rife with interpersonal violence sexual abuse of children right. um and the you know like the best way to prevent your child from being sexually exploited is to like tell them the real names of their body parts you know i heard um i i, I was you know scrolling through twitter and i you know i follow folks and they they post like like so-and-so was convicted of sexually harassing a minor. So-and-so was, uh, you know, arrested for sexually exploiting young children. And it's police officers and ministers. That seems to be most of the people that are committing Thanks. this work. And I heard a horrible story about a young girl. I think she was four or five years old. And she was being sexually exploited. Um, I don't remember if it was like from like at her school or from her church, but like somebody in her community was touching her, but she had been taught that her bot to call her vulva her cookie. And so when she reported that someone was touching her cookies for too long, they believed that this was like a lunchbox dispute issue and did not understand <laughs> what was happening. And it's right. our own shame, right? We're projecting right. our own shame onto our children and it's preventing them from being able to ask for what they want or stand up to predators. Wow. Yeah. I, and in, for me, when I was a child, like we didn't have the internet, but I was still ax I was still had access to porn. Like we're yeah. gonna find it. We, we, children just get their hands into shit and you can't stop them. I mean, mm -hmm. I was looking at adults. I was looking at pornography, like magazines and stuff when I was yep. like 10 years old Yep, and Absolutely. not understanding. And then when, then my friends, their parents had homemade porn. And they knew our friends knew where it was stashed, and we snuck that shit and watched it. I was yeah, watching I don't know. I feel like the ten. Yeah, but the, yeah, that's not just porn. <laughs> that's like you watch it your neighbors, right? Yeah, well, yeah. I yeah, mean, it's, it, granted, it's ethically not the greatest thing to be. We were ten years old. We were drinking course, some yeah. schnapps, like. <laughs> we were highly unsupervised. I remember. I mean, I was drawing. Yeah. I was I was obsessed with drawing naked. Like in the third grade, I went through this like phase where I'd go to the art museum with my my little charcoal and pen and draw all of like the Greek statues, like with a huge focus on genitalia. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. My parents had the Joy of Sex book on their yeah. bookshelf. That's a classic. That was a good. That was Anise, a good one too. Anise Nin Erotica was my was my intro. I don't know if I recommend that path. <laughs> It's fine. Sounds um, a little. But yeah, interest. And that's the thing. It's like interest in sex is pathologized when it's actually the most normal thing in the world. Well, I don't even yeah. understand that. I mean, it's literally how we exist. Right. right. Why can't we talk about it? We pretend that sex is violence and we pretend that violence is sex. Uh, yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. those two things can be, but it's not all there is. You Correct. Know? Yeah. It's like they just took this thing sex and they're like it's bad like it's just bad all around right. like just don't do it unless you're gonna pop a baby out right right but it's so fun right 
And it's good for you. It's good for your skin. It reduces your risk of cancer. It's good for your joints. Like all of the benefits of weightlifting times 10. Like sex is good for you. Yeah, yeah. Masturbation is good for you. But throughout history, a lot of smart, well-meaning people seem to genuinely believe that people enjoying themselves by themselves is like the problem with society. And the age verification Mm -hmm. laws are coming from the same place as the end demand laws. We say we're protecting children we say we're protecting women when in fact we are trying to eradicate the oldest profession right right so speaking of history you in your one of your um your presentations that you do you talk about um an experiment with monkeys and money oh yes yes do i do you, do you mind sharing is it not at all it's one of my favorite okay. facts yes of <laughs> okay. course absolutely and it's real so, it's a real story right this is, yeah this true. is real okay <laughs> so i yeah so i have a i have a live show um called whore's eye view where i cover ten thousand years of history from a sex worker's perspective but really it's millions of years from history from a sex worker's perspective because i start with monkeys um and so you know scientists or economists or zoologists or whoever, whatever department it was, probably an interdepartment thing, at Yale uh, spent who knows how much money teaching captive monkeys what uh, money is. And so they set up a little monkey store where monkeys could exchange tokens for grapes, uh, which monkeys love, especially in a closed economy. So cute. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So they had like a little <laughs> monkey store and like, you know, the monkey would come with their little grape or their, their little token and then they would get like a grape. And as soon as the concept clicked, right, as soon as monkeys attached value to these tokens that they'd been given, the first thing that happened, the first observed behavior was that a boy monkey gave a girl monkey a token and then they had sex. It's the first thing that that happened. It sounds natural to me. Right. And we've observed this behavior in uh, all kinds of species of birds, including, I think, most famously penguins, a wide variety of primates, including, like, you know, multiple species of monkeys. And we know from early human history that sex for meat, sex for something of value, using sex to get your needs met, it, this is not a uniquely human or sort of like post capitalist tactic. Certainly not. I'm a huge fan yeah. of these Planet Earth yes. shows, series, you know what I mean? I think it's yes. Planet Earth 2, and they mm-hmm. show this particular marine mammal, um, and it's like a funny-looking dolphin. It's not your typical sure. dolphin, and it's got like a long like a long snout, John. It's pretty mm-hmm. long. And they go, the males, only the males, go to the bottom of the floor, and yeah. they pick out shiny rocks. Yes. And they place them inside of their snout and they lift themselves out of the water very slowly to display the shiny rock. Amazing. And that's to get a female to come and have sex with him. So he's literally like, look, girl, I got this diamond, you know, yeah. like <laughs> trading yeah. shiny rocks for sex. In the Same ocean. thing. Crows <laughs> do this. I forget. I mean, it's probably a bunch of different species of birds, right? Where the male goes and like collects shiny beautiful things yes. and like builds a house and then you know like the female of the species comes around and is like do i want to live in this house or not i mean it's <laughs> a fair and reasonable question uh, yeah. yeah oh it's so good um so you've been doing this work for a long time now and like are you headed back to like legislation type rooms and meetings like that's what's a, your work like that's a great question so i you know i started my career as a stand-up comedian right touring uh clubs and colleges all over the country and then i became the director of communications for decriminalized sex work and that's when i started talking to legislators and policymakers and you know nonprofit boards and and media in a more serious way but after years of doing that work it became really clear to me that we are not going to get good policy change on this issue Mm. unless and until we get cultural change on this issue, right? We can't Mm. change the laws until we change the stories. And so I've been really focused on cultural change over the course of the last couple of years, specifically talking about sex work through the lens of history, right? So, you know, sitting down talking to legislators, when you start talking about sex work, everyone pictures their daughter, 
right? That's like the first thing that happens, like the real or hypothetical daughter doing this work. And I want to shift the conversation to reminding people that a lot of us have grandmothers that have done this work and it Mm. changes the story. It becomes a cool survival tactic, right? It becomes um, uh, an entrepreneurial journey. It becomes um, a great family story and people are able to look at, you know, the options that their grandmothers had and say like, yes, this, this makes sense. Um, And I think it recenters the conversation outside of the like moral technological panic that we're having of the day becomes less about like the internet or Snapchat or AI or like whatever legislators are most afraid of and places it back in its place of like, no, this has been a thing that's been a part of all of our communities for literally the whole time. And the technology changes, but the, but the, but the details really don't. Um, And so, you know, I do that through the Oldest Profession podcast, where every episode we do a deep dive on a different sex worker from history. And I do that through the live show, where I cover 10,000 years of history from a sex worker's perspective. And Mm -hmm. a huge amount of the work that we do at Old Pros is encouraging sex workers, right, to reclaim our legacy and reminding, uh, you know, policymakers and just people in the community that we have always been and we will always be here um and so that's that's our focus so we lend assistance you know to you know sex worker advocates if you think it would be helpful for you know me to testify i travel all over the world i am happy to do that but we've sort of stepped back from like the the ledges the churning of like the legislative cycle and individual bills towards larger broader public education that makes a lot of sense because this this younger generation is moving into office correct right yes and and we want them to move in with real real world education yes. real world meaning from the people who are doing it correct. not from anecdotal things you see on the internet or just some one random mm-hmm. person you know talk to one stripper one night you know like right. actually being immersed in events like yours it's awesome and my i wonder yeah. i'm i'm curious do have you had people come up to you like after a show yeah. and been like, "Wow, you changed my mind"? Yeah, I okay. have, Tell and us it's about that. one of the most moving experiences sure. that you can have on the road. I mean, obviously, I love connecting to sex workers, and I love like hearing old pro stories and learning about like sex workers from history in every city that we travel to. But hands down, my favorite like demographic of audience is when someone brings their parent or like somebody else in their life who isn't sure, and they come up to me and tell me that I changed their mind that like that is why I do this work right I love bringing people together I love you know like rallying the rallying the troops actually I don't I don't love war analogies but you know what I mean (laughs) you know speaking to the choir I I love that it feels really good but I really love moving people out Mm. of this deep dark entrenched false belief about like what sex work is and what sex is Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. That must feel really good. And that's the whole point of doing this work is, mm-hmm. yes, we want to talk to our people, but like, even for this podcast, like I, I like hearing when a, a non stripper yes. sex worker is listening to it. Cause I'm like, Oh, you're learning, you know, yes. and particularly men, men, yep. men should listen. <laughs> Super helpful. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I've really kind of zeroed in um, on moms, right? And like maybe that's my own mm. like family trauma. Like so many artists, we're just doing our, you know, like family stuff. Mm-hmm. And also, I think that like self identified progressive women that consider themselves to be feminists who really want to be right on this issue is the most important demographic to move, right? Like anti sex conservatives, I our natural enemies, right? Like if you're not with <laughs> us on abortion, if you're not with us on like LGBTQ plus rights, like if you don't think trans people should exist, sure, it feels consistent that you're also like sex work, ew, fine. But if you are right. a pro-choice feminist who is spending any of your time and money and energy fighting to make life harder for sex workers, you've missed the boat. Like you're, this is... 
a misapplication um, of these these core 100%. ideas because they they are so tenacious and they yes. are they're effective and they're efficient and they're intelligent and they think they're right and they think they're right so i'm just like if you could just hone your skills yeah. and ability and talent towards doing actual Listen. good that we yes. need bring your moms to my show bring oh my send my podcast to to your moms you know like it's we we play respectability pod politics, right? There's not that much cursing. I try to keep things within the navigational beakers. I mean, you said yourself, right? Like I, I have this background as a stand-up comedian. I've worked as a shock jock before. That is not the gotcha. vibe that, that we've developed sense. at Old Pros, right? right? We, right. Uh, we are meant to be an accessible platform and we hope to act as a resource for people's first touch um, on this issue. Yeah. yeah. There are no stupid questions at Old Pros. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Also, and yeah. Yeah. Your work is incredible. And Thank it's you. so fun watching you on stage. You're hilarious and like just felt like being in the the dressing room, which I mm -hmm. miss so much. I feel like I say that every episode. Um yeah, yeah. it was such a blast watching you and I and and also I did want to talk about before we while I have you the Gilgo Beach special. Yeah, Thank on ABC. So <laughs> much. Yes, for anyone who yeah. is unaware, the Gilgo Beach murders were uh, serial killing murders that happened in uh, Long Long Beach Island or Long Island? Long, Long Island, yeah. Long so New York, Island. New Jersey, Long Island. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. uh and you were a guest on the ABC special. Can you was. share with our audience? Yeah. A little bit about uh, that? Yeah, I would love it. it. Was um it was such an honor to be to be asked to do that. Um mm -hmm. and I think it's really important work that that isn't for everyone, right? Because the, the reality of that um, you know, ABC documentary is they did a lot of things that you know, ABC documentaries do, right? They sure. sensationalize the violence. It's a lot of b-roll of you know like people in heels and marshes and you know really sort of playing up uh how dangerous sex work is without mm. a critical analysis to how criminalization makes us more vulnerable to that violence and you know if you look at all of the interviews that they did um i really feel like i i got to kind of um I guess sneak in there isn't quite the right word, but try to bring that narrative to light. And so, you know, a lot of what I said was left on the cutting room floor, sure. but they did give me like one of the last words. Um, and I think that I was able to articulate that like when you're thinking about why serial killers target sex workers, yeah. it's not because sex work is inherently violent it's that we are more vulnerable to predators because we are members of a criminalized class. Right. We can't yeah. report violence committed against us. And increasingly, we can't even take safety precautions without risking arrest, uh, right. which is just another form of violence. The sesta fossa elimination back page, et cetera. Yeah. So bad. Horrible. You know, sesta fossa is actually in, like, impacting sex workers all over the world. No, it doesn't surprise yeah. me at all. I just came from, um, I toured my show in New Zealand and across Australia, and I got to meet sex workers and hang out with people. And, you know, New South Wales decriminalized sex work in 1995, yeah. and New Zealand decriminalized sex work in 2003. So they have, like, human rights. Uh, you know, they, right. they, they are not members of it. We're, they've, we're going into, like, our second generation of sex workers that feel yeah. very comfortable reporting <sighs> violence committed against them. Good. Reporting. There was a case in New Zealand, uh, a, a fantastic young sex worker successfully sued her brothel manager for sexual harassment, for, like, trying to... Anyway, the sex workers of New Zealand are amazing. However, in the immediate aftermath of Sesta Fosta, they can't be on social media. They're having their accounts banned. They like they're even being denied access to payment platforms because of policies that are coming out of the United States. Yeah, it's egregious. Be, yeah, well, because the the social media apps are on yes. our U.S. run, of course, right? Yes. And yep. I mean, that's the whole thing with TikTok right now is it's the only social media platform that is not regulated by mm -hmm. the United States government. It's literally the only one, which makes so right. much sense why they want to take it away. Right. from us under the guise of like all this other shit. I don't even believe them. Anyway, it doesn't it, it doesn't surprise me at all because mm -hmm. like 
all of the platforms changed. So they would have to comply no matter what country they live in, but also getting denied banking even in their country. Yeah. So the the problem is, is that New Zealand doesn't have a lot of like banks. So they're dependent on other countries. And, and so like, you Mm. know, when Visa, MasterCard, like these big international, right. right, Global banking, it's Mm -hmm. their policies are sort of trumping local, local policies. So you can have like a legal licensed business. You can be like not uh, operating outside of the law locally, but we also see that with legal content creators here, you know, like OnlyFans or porn performers or like people, you know, even people that are working in strip clubs, like, yeah, it, these folks are having their bank accounts uh, shut down, are being like systematically denied access to yeah. banking technology and investment platforms in the name of protecting us from our own choices. Right? It's ridiculous. I used to like I used to plan out when I would go to the bank. Like I yeah. would like yeah. not bring too much money at one time, right. or I would. Sp- I'd be like, oh, I already dropped like three G's in the bank last week. Like I have to wait another yep. two weeks because if I keep walking in with this cash and I even asked the teller straight up once. I was like, y'all watch me bringing cash in here. You watching mm-hmm. me? And they're like, no, what are you talking about? No, we right. Want- yeah. right, right, right. <laughs> it's not the smartest thing to ask them, but I was just like. I get it, it though. Yeah. yeah. I just and wanted it's- to know. And it's so silly, right? Because like we get discriminated against as like women or queer presenting folks, right? Like people think nothing of dudes walking in with like tens of thousands of dollars, like cash check or whatever. But, you know, if you look like somebody who could be doing sex work and it's, and it's frustrating for me too, because women who, you know, have never engaged in sex work face the same kind of discrimination and it doesn't turn them against whorephobia it turns them against sex workers, right? So you'll hear folks that are like, well, if, you know, if sex workers didn't exist, then I wouldn't get catcalled. And I'm like, well, ma'am, that is not (laughs) science. (laughs) That is not, yeah. They're like, well, they think I'm a whore. I'm like, that's not what's happening. (laughs) (laughs) No, No, I've been literally been like covered in sweatpants and a hoodie head to toe. Um, And I'm getting catcalled. Um, But yeah, and we have also are seeing a similar conversation happening um, in like the strip clubs and whatnot because there's different levels of sex work happening inside of the strip clubs. And then some of the dancers are getting upset with the other dancers who are doing extras as opposed to really, you know, analyzing the system and how the system is literally pitting us against us, against each other so that we get – we don't go as far. We don't get as far as yeah. in trying to preserve or even like build any autonomy or safety or anything. We can't because now we're just fighting with each other. Well, you're more of a whore yeah. than I am. And it's like, well, that's the hierarchy. Right. And that's, that's yeah, correct. Helping. Yeah, it's the hierarchy. And you're not, you know, you're not building yourself up by by cutting somebody else down. But like the yeah, the criminalized nature of this work, it, it lends to that, right? Like, totally. and you see the same tensions across labor movements, right? Okay. Like people are higher yeah. up on the totem pole, like shitting on people lower on the totem pole. And right. it creates, I mean, you know, this cartoon has been reproduced since I think the medieval period right with like kings and serfs but you know like the king or the bank or the capitalist or you like whatever you know takes 99 percent of the pie and then throws the crumbs on the table and is like that guy's trying to take your guy's share and it's like well that's not that's not (laughs) that's not the whole story yeah we're fighting over crumbs because where did the rest of the cake go you know right exactly (laughs) yeah Yeah. that's a really good analogy yeah wow so yeah so you're on that's as true oh yeah Yeah. thank you (laughs) yeah yeah i don't i want to make sure we talk about it because you're all over the place it's true yeah so i'm in new york um for the next three weeks, I don't know when this episode comes out, but I have shows at the Lori Beachman Theater, or if you are in the New York area, um, it's on 42nd and 9th. I love this theater. I hope it's okay for me to gush about it. Please do. Um, it's, so it's in the heart of the theater district, right, on 42nd Street and 9th Avenue, but it feels like a secret because you have to walk through the West Bank restaurant to like get, and like go down this stairwell, Ooh. and then it opens up into this beautiful 
cabaret theater. Like Joan Rivers has performed there. Annie Sprinkle has performed there. Joe Weldon has performed there. So wow. I'm so excited uh, that I get to that I get to be a part of this theater's um, pro sex worker history. <laughs> That's so rad. Yeah, this Thank episode you. is coming out. In a few days. So oh, fantastic. Great. Yeah, so if you're so in New York, come check me out. <laughs> yeah. I'm also going to be in uh, Charleston and Denver and Orlando. Uh, we're looking at dates wow. in DC, San Francisco, LA, Boston, uh, New Hampshire. Um, I'm also going to Reykjavik, uh, Iceland, oh my God, which is really just, exciting. That is yeah, so you used cool. to live in Iceland. I used to live in Iceland. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. Um, we're I'm going to Edinburgh, Scotland. I'm going I to love Oxford, Edinburgh. England. It's so beautiful. Oh, you're yes. going to love Edinburgh. I'm so yes. excited. We're oh. looking at dates. We don't have them confirmed yet in uh, Berlin, Budapest, Lisbon, uh, Vienna. So, yeah. And if you would like me, if, if, if you have a theater or know somebody who has a theater or a venue – reach out like we are we are trying to take this show to as many places and as many people as humanly possible so email me reach out and let's talk about how we can put a show together and if any of those places are where you're at or we're always adding new dates and you can find all of that at whoreseyeview.com well i'm super impressed i think that's amazing that Thank you're you. on so much tour um and when are you being like broadcast is on, on television? Not so yet. Far. No, that okay. is, that is the end goal. Yeah. So w- yeah, I, ideally okay. we would like uh, to get the show on a streaming platform, right. In with the objective of like getting it in front of as many people as possible. Um, but what's happening in the meantime um, is everywhere that I go, I'm connecting to sex workers and sex worker rights advocates. And I'm getting to like, tour brothels in places where it's decriminalized and like hear about how it's going in places that have criminalized clients. And oh, so, man. you know, I'm really looking forward to, you know, coming back, uh, having seen examples. I mean, we're going to Norway, we're going to Iceland, we're going to Canada. Like I get to see how the end demand policies are playing out. I've oh, gotten to see decriminalization. I'm excited to go to Amsterdam um, and, you know, Nevada and look at what legalization actually looks like. But, you know, it's one thing to study this issue and it's another to meet people and talk to people who exactly. day in, day out have to live with these policies. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh my god, I'm like just overwhelmed with inspiration <laughs> and like joy for what Yay. you're experiencing. Thank it's you. just so so cool. Like all I want is to hang out with strippers and sex workers. Yes, like, the only people I want to hang out. With. We're the coolest, and we have <laughs> been know. across time. <laughs> yeah, know. anything and like anything cool in all of human history. <laughs> if you scratch the surface a little bit, you will find sex workers there. Right? We would not have jazz without like you know the brothels of Storyville. We we have been right, correct? The dancers yeah. of Atlanta. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we don't just create culture. We are culture. Exactly. Yeah. Unreal. So cool. Please tell Thank everyone you. exactly how to find you. Absolutely. The best way to keep up with all of our work is to get on our email list. Uh, you can sign up to stay in the know like an old pro at oldprosonline.org. Um, every week we send up a roundup of sex worker rights related news from around the world. In addition to new podcasts coming out, um, old podcasts we want to highlight because they suddenly become relevant in the news cycle again, uh, which, you know, Comstock keeps coming up, unfortunately. Um, and also, of course, upcoming uh, live dates, including Whore's Eye View, public debates, um, or public speaking that I do. Um, yeah. So yeah, and you can hear about all of that through our newsletter. Ch- please check out our website. Follow us online at oldprosonline.org uh, or at it. oldprosonline on social media. Final thought, if, if someone's mom is listening. If someone's mom is listening. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's a, that's a really, that's a great question. Um, that immediately brings other questions, right? Like, <laughs> do you suspect that your child is a sex worker? Do you know? Do you have any, do you like, what's your deal? Um, but yeah, so speaking, speaking to, to a parent, um, who has like just found out that their child is a sex worker, you have been told by society 
that that means a lot of things about your kid that it just doesn't. And so sex worker rights are where gay rights were in like the late 1960s. So we used to believe that homosexuality was um, not only a crime, but a disease, a kind of pathology. And we've been told really similar things about sex work. But the first woman to run for president in the United States was a sex worker. Victoria Woodhull announced her candidacy in 1870. Some of the most successful entrepreneurs, uh, innovators, philanthropists, and artists spent time as a sex worker. Being a sex worker is a lot like being a waitress. Um, it's you know a job that a lot of folks do um, to get through a rough patch, and it doesn't mean anything about you or your kid because all kinds of people have done sex work for all kinds of reasons, and so long as your kid can always come home that's the thing that's going to keep them safe. It's not like doing or not doing sex work. It's knowing that they have a safe place to land, hopefully with a non-judgmental parent like you. That was really great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. What an honor. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us. And thank you to our audience, as always, for tuning in. This is one of the best episodes, I think, that I've ever done. You're amazing. And this is such helpful, important information for so many people out there. And it's like reinvigorating my, my own advocacy work that I do. It's hard to not feel burnt out. So this was really invigorating. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really, I really take that in. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, this running a podcast or doing an email, it can sometimes feel like shouting into an empty cave. Yeah. So it really mm -hmm. means the world. Um, because the work that you're doing here is so important. Um, I've listened to a few episodes and like these conversations, we are all contributing to the destigmatization of this work. And together, we can change the story about sex work. And that's on period. Network. <laughs>